Um, skin disease versus skin condition. Growing up, I've always considered um, my vitiligo as a skin disease. Um, when people was looking and staring and they wanted to know what was going on with my skin, I would always refer to it as um, a skin disease. Um, over the years um, in the community, people see the word disease as um, something to frown upon. Um, so a lot of people refer to it as a skin condition. Um, there's a, a world-renowned model, Winnie Harlow, and um, someone had um, put in an article that she, um, that she suffers from vitiligo. And her response to the, to the editor was, do I look like I'm suffering? So I guess it's in the eyes of the beholder of how you perceive um, your journey with vitiligo. How do I treat people? I mean, oh, oh, like, how, the, okay. yeah. How yeah. Like well, I mean, no one wants to be stared at. I mean, if 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 you know, if you want to to know, I mean, ask it in a way that's not intrusive, because um, a lot of people will like to tell you what's going on, or or um, you know, have their own private space. Um, you know, um, in the social media days, people take pictures and they post it. And they may learn some education on, on that, but also if you read the, read the comments, you have people um, saying some very derogatory things. Um, um, I remember times that, you know, I would be driving home from work and um, I refused to pull over to get gas, even though I'm on E because the gas station was full, because I knew that um, someone at the gas pump would possibly be taking pictures or, or saying something, you know, something that w was, wasn't right. So, you know, um, it, 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 took, it, it takes a lot. It depends on your mental capacity of, in, a, in, a, in a day. Like, you know, if you worked all day long and you had a rough day, you just don't want to stop and something that's, you know, natural that you just go pump your gas and you have to deal with somebody else being disrespectful. Um. Probably my mother. My mother, um, you know, uh, when I first noticed spots on my hands, um, you know, very curious, didn't know what it was. Um, then it moved to my face. Um, and the two dots in my eyes right here, you know, it was, it got, it was kind of freaking me out. And didn't know what was going on. So, you know, we tried several things. You know, my mother, um, first thing, you know, we went to Hudson Belk and we tried a um, makeup called Dermablend. How old were you? Um, probably 12, 11, 12 years old. Um, and, um, you know, the, the lady at the, um, at the desk, at the makeup counter, she, um, she applied it. And um, I had two dots, but she applied it, kind of just smoothed it out to blend it all the way, all the way over. And, um, you know, it, it looked good. So um, that's what we went with. Um, you know, once I ended up um, purchasing it, I got home and started putting some, you know, on my hands and my arms, my knees, because I was playing basketball and, you know, um, and I thought it would work. But trial and error shows me that, you know, um, when I was in school, when I had it on my hand, you know, all my papers had nothing but makeup on it. So I couldn't wear makeup on my hands. So I just pretty much just had it, the cover on my face um, um, from, you know, middle school, like I said, sixth grade, there's two dots here. By the time I got around um, to eighth grade, it was circling around my eye. So um, looked like I had on um, like some shades or something and around my mouth, nose. So, um, uh, I kept the makeup on and it made it, it made it look natural for me. How did you handle it, like playing sports and gym? Well, the Dermer Blend um, was a good product. Um, uh, did it run? Yeah, it ran. Um, it, it's still covered though. Um, you could tell that I had it like in the evenings, if I was going somewhere else, I would have to refresh it because um, once I set up in the morning, um, you had to put on, you put it on, then you put setting powder on for like five minutes and let it sit. Then you brush it off and you're gone. So it gives you more of a dry feel. But as the day as your body heats up, it uh, kind of loosens up. 
um, as far as swimming, playing basketball, it's, it stayed on. Um, it's just that, say if I had a hard foul or, and I hit someone's shirt, then, you know, uh, the makeup will be on their shirt. Um, or, you know, uh, if I'm wearing a light shirt like today, um, like right here, would be full of pretty much makeup. Um, and so that's kind of um, how I had to live. Um, it made me feel good. It didn't bring so much attention. Um, you know, I could always put on a ball cap, um, maybe a long sleeve shirt, long pants, and put my hands in my pocket and I could blend in anywhere. Um, how do you say if somebody says, uh, uh, how, how do you describe the condition? I still describe it as a skin disease or skin condition. Um, it's, it's not uh, something that's contagious, not something that's, um, uh, it doesn't hurt. Uh, what hurts is uh, people's uh, perception of, of, of vitiligo and um, you know, that's what hurt is, is the emotional side, the mental side, the social side, is that you really, it's the unknown, you know, and um, today's society hadn't gotten to the point where is they um, have accepted fully what vitiligo is. Um, some people know um, and some people uh, think they know and, you know, we just want to be able to educate ones to let them know what's vitiligo and you know, how to love somebody with vitiligo, how to treat somebody with vitiligo. Um, and that's, that's been my journey since removing my makeup. Uh, people want to know if it's contagious. Vitiligo is not contagious. Um, you can't get it just by touching me. Um, it was times when I would grow up, when I grew up, um, uh, nobody really knew what vitiligo was. And um, I had some friends that uh, in the neighborhood, they had a pool. And I remember at times going uh, swimming with them and um, when I get in the pool everybody else would get out and and it was just that at the time people didn't know if it was contagious or what it was. Um, doctors say it's, it could be hereditary. Um, no one in my family has has, has vitiligo other than me. Um, uh, there's there's several different forms of vitiligo that that's what people that don't don't know is um, you know what I have is universal and universal it has taken um, all of my pigment. So um, some are just focal um, um, and it's just in certain areas. Some may just get in one spot, maybe patch your hair, maybe in the mouth or what have you. So I mean, it's just, it's, uh, when I go out and talk to different folks, um, especially someone that's new to having vitiligo, um, mine is universal, so it's more of the extreme and Sometimes it can be um, mentally challenging to have a conversation with me thinking that your skin is going to um, depigment just totally just like mine. I think mine is a rare case, um, and that's why it's important that uh, we kind of, you know, get the funding and get uh, the word out of what vitiligo is and how we can treat it, or if there's a cure for it. Um, we need all those parts together because, um, you know, no one knows what, what totally causes vitiligo. Um, uh, they know it's an auto, autoimmune um, uh, deficiency, but uh, they, don't, they cannot pinpoint um, uh, exactly the cause of it. What was it like living with vitiligo and dating? Um, I was a late bloomer. I didn't even start dating until I was you know, um, 12th, 12th grade. Um, I guess that was one of my biggest fears if I, if, if I would ever find someone interested in me, you know. Um, you know, I would always try to bring attention to myself other than the, the vitiligo. So I would have to, you know, uh, put it on a little more as far as uh, might have been clothes or, or um, might have been jewelry or anything. It's just that I had to have that edge to um, attract someone to 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 come in to talk to me, and you know, as I got into college, you know, um, you know, I felt that, um, you know, I I felt women started being attracted to me because because of curiosity, you know, um, what's up with him, you know, um, 
and you know but it was more so uh people that i met that i might have dated um i generally met them through someone else it wasn't like if when i walked in the room uh, i felt like it, it would be one would be like who is that you know um it had to be someone that knew my personality and knew who i am um to to um introduce me and that's kind of how it was dating but early on i didn't know i was I was gonna be able to get married or if I was even to have kids. It's just, you know, mentally it just, it was, it was draining, you know. Um, um, I never atten attended my junior or senior prom. I never did any of that. Um, Why? Um, one, for my junior year was, um, um, I didn't have anybody to go with. Um, all my friends went, but like I said, I wasn't dating. Um, my senior year, I, I, um, I was dating, well, I was seeing my, my son's mother, you know, um, I ended up, you know, uh, and we couldn't go to the prom together, so she couldn't go, so I didn't go. But um, those events like dances and parties, you know, um, in high school, I really didn't um, uh, do. I did football games, basketball games, and pizza afterwards. Other than that, as far as like uh, my friends that was dating and on the phone, you know, when they get home, I didn't have that, that luxury unless I was at their house, you know. Uh, what was your personality? You said people knew your personality. Well, you know, I mean, I've always been a standoffish person um, until you get to know me, and then I can become somewhat a life of the party. Um, some people may say I might be a somewhat conceited or arrogant, but I think Vitilago has made me um, somewhat, um, uh, takes a minute for me to warm up in certain areas I go into. You know, um, it could be someone I walk in a room, it could be someone's um, response that may make me with, you know, stand back and just observe what's going on because um, I'm not comfortable. You know, I may be comfortable with my friends, but there's something different. There's a different dynamic. So, um, you know, and still to this day, um, you know, I'm nowhere long. You know, I mean, if I get invited somewhere, I'm in there, I'm breezing through, and I'm breezing right on out, you know, and, um, and that's just pretty much just how I've been. Tell me the story about how you met your wife. Yeah, so um, I went to high school with my wife. I didn't know her. She's a year older than I am. And um, the day that my best friend's mother uh, had a brain aneurysm and she was rest, rushed to the hospital, um, I picked my mother up and took her to the emergency room. And we're sitting in the emergency room and, and trying to figure out what's going on with Miss Joyce. And she come walking by and you know, I look familiar. So probably about 10 minutes, I went to the lobby, and while I was sitting in the lobby, she was sitting there, and we were just having a conversation, and she was just saying that she was um, in there. Her father has, you know, has cancer, and you know, she spent a lot of time in the hospital, and um, she was bringing him in, and um, we uh, started talking. Um, her cousin works, well, at the time, was working with me at Longview, Longview um, uh, Alternative School here in Raleigh. And um, we just started talking, and um, so um, that's how I met her. Um, then I've asked her cousin to tell her, give her my number, and you know we would talk from time to time, um, and you know that's that's how we met. Um, and you know I got out of a long-term relationship, and um, when I got out of the relationship. Um, we we would hang out, we'd go out to eat, have fun, and she would always invite me to different places like um, you know the church, most of the church. And uh, once one one Sunday, she invited me out to Men's Day at her church, and I go over there and um, pop up, and there's her father sitting there, her mother, and um, they had a guest speaker out of St. Louis, and he his his message was that he met his wife, and on the third day he proposed to her. And his wife's response was, what took you so long? So it, it kind of hummed in on my, you know, made me 
give more attention to to the sermon and and what stood more than anything is he said he didn't date his wife to marry her he married his wife to date her so that was around june 19th of um 20 2010 by july 31st i was engaged uh, and um so it was my birthday july 26 it was my 35th birthday um i had a family reunion in town um didn't ever think i was gonna you know um if i was to get married didn't think i was gonna do a big wedding um so i felt like i got all my family here you know i can you know propose um and we could probably go to justice of peace or what what have you so um that night uh, i wrestled with um how i was gonna propose um i had already had my birthday set up at a new restaurant in, in raleigh called red bowl and um i already had the ring and we um scheduled to go out there. I was the last one there. Everybody calling me, asking me, where are you at? And I'm like, I'm on, I'm on my way. And what took me so long is that I had reached out to a father um, before, me, before going to the restaurant where everybody was. And I asked him permission to uh, propose to his daughter. And he said, Terrell, you know, that's what I've been living for. You know, um, you know he, has, he has stage four cancer at the time. And he said that I, I want to give her away. And, and so, you know, I, I got his consent. I went to the party. Uh, my father walks outside and he was like, what's going on? And he's like, why is all this? Because you know, I had spent some good money. I had spent money for ice sculptures, bands, and fire dancers, all types of stuff. And he's like, what's going on? So uh, at that time, I told my father um, um, my intentions. And he just started laughing. He said, Latrice is a good girl. Yeah, my father asked, does my mother know? I told him, nah, she doesn't, she doesn't know. He said, well, I'm going to tell her to come outside and talk to you. So he goes inside and um, she comes outside with her pocketbook. And um, so she was like, Alvin said that you need help with, um, with the expenses of this party. And I said, uh, I probably do. And I said, but um, um, I'm going to I'm gonna propose to Latrice tonight, and she's like, she, you know, she was kind of shocked, and you know, she she received it well, and so we went on, we partied, had a good time, and um, so outside on on the balcony out there, they had um, I had the fire dancers out there, and I had a, a hostess that was giving out T-shirts and prizes and stuff, and so she passed out uh, fortune cookies, and the night before I had put. Uh, the ring inside of the fortune cookie and and I handed her the one to give to Latrice and whenever they opened it you know people got prizes once they read it and I hadn't even read the fortune in the cookie so whenever she cracked it all she read was a relationship would become permanent and I got down on one knee and proposed and she hugged me and kissed me and said yes, but still hadn't read, seen the ring on the inside. So, um, you know, so that was the proposal. And um, week after that, I was on fast track. You know, I was, um, that was first week in August. I was married by April 23rd. Yeah, I mean, um, growing up, I had a son at an early age. My son was born when I was 17 and a half, 18 years old. Um, so, uh, uh, he was, he didn't grow up in my household, but um, growing up, when the time he got into elementary school, middle school, high school, you know, it's, he never had that, that father, father-son connection as far as me doing lunches with him, field trips, field day, um, and I did it to protect him. And I protected him, I felt I was protecting him um, by way of um, not being seen and whereas people can joke him or bully him or, you know, um, you know kids are cruel. Um, and so uh, if I can get something back, it will be those lunch dates. What about baby girl? 
baby girl, you know, um, I had to reverse um, what I missed from him. You know, um, I needed to make sure that vitiligo is, is out there where people know what it is. Um, um, because I don't want to miss any more of those days that I missed from John. You know, um, John doesn't regret me not being there, but I regret not being there. And, and I had to just take a stance. Um, is that, you know, the first day that she um, stepped in um, elementary school, I was there. And that was something that I had never done before. Um, and, you know, she's, you know, uh, little girls, I guess, are a little different. You know, she tells me all the time, like, Dad, I want to be just like you. And uh, I'm saying to myself, you know, uh, how do you say no? <laughs> you know, but, um, but she, uh, you know, she had a little light spot on her cheek. And, and I was thinking that um, I have to, um, you know, if, if it is vitiligo, I have to get ahead of it, you know, um, and that's why I've been you know, fighting so hard to bring awareness to what vitiligo is because uh, I, I dealt with a lot growing up. Um, these kids now, um, I don't think I could, the way, way social media is set up, I don't know mentally how I'd be able to um, move around in the school system. Um, so that's why I fight so hard to make sure people know what vitiligo is um, because of the stigma, the disrespect, and what people do for likes. You know, I mean, they, they would sacrifice someone's, um, someone's uh, mental capacity um, just to get a like. And, and I want to be able to um, be that change agent to make sure that um, it doesn't happen. And if it does happen, because you can have some people that's ignorant, but you know, you have someone that's gonna step in and be able to educate um, that person or what vitiligo is that doesn't have vitiligo. So that's why um, I do what I do. Um, you, know, if, you know, would I ever wear makeup again? Mm, it's a hard thing to say. Not me, not for me, I wouldn't. Um, you know, if, if, if my daughter or my son or someone would have makeup, I mean, would have vitiligo and they chose to wear makeup, I would probably do it just to support them. And that's just, you know, whatever their journey is, um, as a father, that's, that's my journey. For the last year, year and some change, um, um, I've seen some of my friends grow um, in their vitiligo, uh, uh, and I and I feel it's because of the mask. You know, the mask has taken away from the stares, uh, the eye contact when people are out in public. Um, some now are battling um, removing the mask because it goes back to um, some of the previous. Uh, comments and things that they had to deal with um, publicly and um, um, you know over a year and a half people's skin has changed um, so you know it's kind of um, uh, it's rough on a lot of them mentally um, and we we have, we have talked about it and we're trying to meet a little more to have um, you know to, to, to lean on each other because no one knows what it, li what it is to live with vitiligo than someone that lives with vitiligo Um, several things, um, um, just the, just the weight and the tension that I was getting, um, the black face, um, um, how, how people was, you know, staring at me more. And when it was time for me to get my driver's license, my renew my license for my, um, birthday, I went and, um. 2017 to renew my license and the DMV examiner refused to take my picture and he said that he wouldn't take my picture because um, I was wearing makeup and I explained to him that you know I have a rare skin disease called vitiligo and that I've had a, a North Carolina's driver's license I was 16 years old so my driver's license all my driver's previous driver's license um, 
along with my passports all have me wearing makeup. And he said, well, I cannot take your picture as long as you have your makeup on. He said, you can, um, you can go to the bathroom, get some tissue and wipe your face off and come back and I'll take your picture. And it, it felt like the world just stopped. So um, once I, I left out of there, uh, the, uh, my wife called and I was upset and she could hear my voice. And uh, she like, what's wrong? And I told her that they refused to take my license, my, my picture. And she asked why. And she immediately just hung up the phone like, I'll call you back. And um, she ended up calling DMV and I guess she really went off because the next call I got was from the DMV commissioner. And um, he said, I heard you had a pretty eventful day today, and um, how can I help you? And I said, well, you know, I went to go get my license, explained to him the story. And he, um, he said he don't know and he'll investigate it, but I can go to another branch to get uh, my picture taken. And I said, well, you know, sir, I like I'm I'm not feeling that today. I said that, you know, I've had enough today. I was like, I appreciate you calling me. But um, had I been someone that's been in a sunken place or depressed or or, you know, uh, battling with 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 stress and or what have you, the state would probably have blood on their hands today. Um, and and I said, I'm not really in the mood. Um, to even come back to get my license. If I get pulled, I get pulled. But um, uh, we'll see next week, but I, I don't want to um, pursue getting my license. And um, I got off the phone. Uh, once I got off the phone, um, I went home because my family was already in, in Virginia, was had a family reunion in Williamsburg. And I drove to Williamsburg uh, and when I got there, I went and took a shower and took my makeup off. Um, we had a family reunion. So that's where we stayed. Um, and the whole weekend in Williamsburg, um, I didn't wear makeup. And what I was noticing, even though I was in a different place, is I wasn't getting the stares that I once was without my makeup. Um, so I kind of had it in my mind to um, ready to remove my makeup completely. Uh, came back in town on that Sunday. As soon as I got home, first thing I did was put my makeup on and then go out and hang out with my friends or what have you. Um, and my wife and my father said, I thought you was done with you know, makeup. And I was like, well, you know, I'm not ready. Um, you know, and it took maybe about two, two more weeks Later, I called a friend of mine who's a photographer and asked him to come over. And uh, he came over one morning and I explained to him about the makeup because he didn't know. And I took it off. I didn't even wear it that day. And he took pictures of it. And I told him what I wanted to do. I wrote a little letter saying, it's me. And, and, and it was just, just to show people that, you know, that um, I've, I've, I wore makeup and now's the time for me to remove it. And I need your support now more than ever um, because, you know, I got a lot of weight on my shoulders. Um, and, and once he took the picture, he did an illustration. I called my best friend. He had about four or 5,000 followers. I asked him to post it. 
and probably about four o'clock that afternoon, he four or five, he posted it, and and it, and you could see the comments like people were like, "We got your back, we support you," and um, that night we had a, a reunion, and uh, we used to host a annual reunion, me, my best friend, and my other friend Lavelle, and um, and when I got out there to the to the club, it was late. Um, I didn't wear makeup. And you could see people when I walked in the room, you know, they was coming over, they was hugging me. They were saying, I got your back. And, you know, that's what I needed. Um, and I, I felt good. So um, the very next morning, I got, a, I got a call. I went on a radio show, um, Stormy Fort. She interviewed me, my first interview, about why did I take off the makeup and how did I feel, you know. Um, so the community definitely embraced it. Uh, and I felt good. Uh, then I hit another another hurdle, and the hurdle was um, now I went from being the most recognizable person in the city to really, if you don't have social media, you don't know what I just went through. So, um, so having to reintroduce myself to to a, a city or community that has raised and loved me. Um, became a little um, stressful. You know, you're going out to basketball games, you're going to grocery stores, and, and people that, you know, you normally speak to, you know, it takes a while like they don't even know you. And uh, that bothered me. You know, I had all the attention. Now I don't have, now I have to reintroduce myself. And, you know, so it took anywhere from about six to eight months for me to really capture, um, going out in public again, um, um, feeling empowered. So it's kind of the stages of, um, you know, vitiligo, you stepping out, worrying about how people are gonna look at you and stare at you. Now on the back end of it, you, 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 you <laughs> it's kind of like you, you can't pick up, you know, um, all the fragmented parts. And, and um, so, uh, you know, I just hope that people can look at um, my stages and my journey to to be empowered because um, that's that's been my fight. Because um, if if my kids should should be should have vitiligo or their kids' kids should have vitiligo, I want them to be able to move around without having the pitfalls that I fell in. You know, um, uh, my son, he's 26 now. He'll be 27 this month. And he'd never known his father to be able to eat lunch with him, do field day with him, um, do all of those, you know, uh, things that little kids wanted their parents to do. Um, and I did it to protect him. And because I didn't want the kids joking him about um, how his father looked. So uh, I think for, for me, um, it has probably been um, blackface. You know, um, I didn't grow up in the 60s or, or, or earlier. And, um, you, know, um, you know, you experience racism, but not hardcore racism. And the word blackface and, you know, uh, was, was always a challenge for me. Um, I was usually during Halloween when I was wearing my makeup, it was a difficult time for me to um, go out in public because those nights uh, people dress up and I could just be coming in from work or just doing anything and um, people would think that I'm in a mask or I'm in, I'm in an outfit or I'm dressed, I'm dressed up as a character and actually I'm just, you know, just my everyday. And um, it was one night a friend of mine had a, a, a party at a club one night and it was, um, it was Halloween and, and I was leaning against the bar and there was two guys at the bar and um, the guy said, uh, what the hell you come as? And, and I was just saying, uh, no, nah, I, didn't, I didn't dress up in anything. He said, you look like a Trump supporter. You came as a Trump supporter. And I said, what does that mean? He said, why do you have um, uh, your face in blackface? And I explained to him um, that um, 
it's, it's called vitiligo. And um, he still kept poking at me, um, just, you know, saying some derogatory things. And, you know, it got to the point where it's, uh, I felt it was best for me to leave because I was really getting um, pretty upset. You know, I just told him that he was really ignorant and what he said was ignorant. Um, and, you know, he seemed like he was pushing, pushing the angles to, to escalate the, um, the conversation. And, I, you know, uh, and it's been several times that I've had to defend myself because of uh, my appearance. I was in Las Vegas and um, walking up the strip and uh, a lady um, felt I was in blackface, it was a Caucasian lady. And she walked up and like, you are very disrespectful. And you know, she was all in my face and, and you know, um, I couldn't defend myself as far as, you know, trying to educate, hey, I have vitiligo, I couldn't, I couldn't do that, you know. She was already, you know, on one. And, you know, um, so, you know, my fears living with vitiligo came more so when uh, President Obama first became president. Uh, because um, at that at that period, the nation was 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 getting the first black African American uh, president, and um, a lot of people didn't like that. And in return, I got caught in the middle of it because either either I was blackface or 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 I was disrespecting the black race, and so uh, I got it from all sides, and and it was a difficult time. Uh, and I battled with it. Say to um, a teen or a preteen living in this context with social media, where people will do anything for likes. How? Do, what word of encouragement do you give them? Well, my word of encouragement is don't don't stop being you. You have to love you. You know, um, you have to embrace you. Uh, you know, you have to own you. And, and I just think that, you know, the biggest gift that you have, and some people will see it as a, a curse, but you have the gift of attention. So whatever room you go into, um, you, you're gonna have that attention. So now that you have that stage, you make the best of every moment you can.